Marion Ledger, Ben Cheney, brother of James Cheney, David Goodman, younger brother of Andrew Goodman, and Mickey Dickoff, who co-directed Neshoba, The Price of Freedom, that's opening tonight here in New York. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute. Kim and Reggie Harris singing Too Many Martyrs, the song of Phil Oaks. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. And as we played that music, we did what Neshoba, The Price of Freedom, did in their film, played the uh, list of the unsolved murders. And it's a remarkably long list. You can go to our website at democracynow.org to see that. Our guests are uh, two of the brothers of two of the three civil rights workers whose case became very well known. Ben Cheney and uh, uh, Andrew Goodman are our guests, brothers of David Goodman and James Cheney. Uh, Mickey Dickoff is our guest, co-director of Neshoba, The Price of Friedman. Jerry Mitchell with us, reporter with the Clarion Ledger. Before we go to Bruce Watson, I wanted to go back to Jerry Mitchell on that list of the unsolved murders. On that day, as they were dredging up, in the days that they were looking for the three civil rights workers, they were dredging up black body after black body. These are the unsolved murders. Talk about who we don't know um, died and who killed them. And that's part of the problem is that there's really never been an attempt to go out and, and account for these. I, I mean, there it seems every day there seems to be another case uh, that resurfaces around the country. I mean, not just in Mississippi, but around the entire country. And, uh, and so that's why it's important. There needs to be accounting. There needs to be, a, a, you know, some attempt to come back and, and, and document each one of these cases, who was killed and what the circumstances were, even if, if justice can't be brought in these cases, uh, because it's very important. It's like in Kansas City, there was a, a, a case a uh, civil rights case there that's now been reopened, uh, killing that took place in 1970. So it, it's, like I said, it's happening all over the country because people just haven't really thought about it, haven't been aware of it, but uh, there were killings that took place and people just, you know, people disappeared in places like Mississippi and, and, and weren't heard from anymore. And uh, Jerry Mitchell, um, Ben Cheney referred a, a few minutes earlier to the Sovereignty Commission. Could you explain what the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission was and its role in this uh, reign of terror that existed back in the 60s? Well, it was it, basically the Sovereignty Commission uh, was kind of part of the reason Mississippi was kind of a police state in those days. It was created, it was kind of the state's answer to the White Citizens Council, kind of a state-authorized White Citizens Council. Uh, it was headed by the governor, no less, uh, and some of those powerful lawmakers. And basically, uh, they had one arm that was kind of like a propaganda arm. They would they would reach out up north in places, and they would uh, promulgate segregation and say, send black speakers up north, pay them, and say, uh, tell them how great segregation is and how you you want segregation too. And then they had this other arm that was kind of a spy arm where they basically infiltrated civil rights groups 
and uh, were able to get that information. And they kind of shared all this information with law enforcement across the state. And of course, unfortunately, a number of these law enforcement in places like we're talking about, uh, Neshoba County and Meridian, a lot of those guys were Klansmen. So they were literally sharing information with some of these same Klansmen who, of course, uh, uh, wound up being involved in, in the killing of these kids. Let's go back to Neshoba, speaking here as Rita Bender, the widow of Michael Schwerner, and Fannie Lee Cheney, the mother of James and Ben Cheney. This case has gotten the attention it has gotten because two of the three men were right. And it's no secret, the world's a cold load. If it hadn't been for Mickey Swan and Andrew Goodman, my son wouldn't have been known and wouldn't have been found today. I think that says a lot about attitudes about race and who's important and whose mother's son matters more. An excerpt of Neshoba. Um, the Price of Freedom, the film opening tonight. And we are going to Bruce Watson, who has written the book Just Out, Freedom Summer, The Savage Season That Made Mississippi Burn and That Made America a Democracy. The significance of this summer, what these three men and so many others died for. Bruce Watson. I think it's important that we put this in the context of the entire summer, as you said. Uh, we mentioned briefly that, uh, that this was part of Freedom Summer, but we, often the story of Freedom Summer is, not, is overshadowed by the murders, and it makes it seem as though the men died in vain. In fact, they were a part of an enormous and incredibly inspiring effort in which 700 college students went to Mississippi, went to the dangerous hellhole of Mississippi that summer to, uh, to live with black people, to register, to live in their shacks, sit on their porches, talk to them, register them to vote when that was possible, and teach in freedom schools, hundreds of freedom, dozens of freedom schools with 2,000 students, teaching them black history, black literature, things that had never been taught in Mississippi. It was a revolutionary effort. Very important not to forget that part of the story. Uh, and of course, uh, Mississippi was the the birthplace of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and and the and it had in essence an impact on the national debate within the Democratic Party, didn't it? Oh, yes, that was another part of Freedom Summer was the Freedom Democratic Party set up as a parallel party because, of course, only 7 percent of African Americans could vote in Mississippi at that time, a shockingly low number, uh, much lower than the rest of the South. So Bob Moses and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee had set up this parallel party to get people to, who couldn't go to the courthouse, who, who were afraid to go to the courthouse, to just sign a form and become members. And then they sent 67 delegates that they chose in their own parallel conventions. They sent them to Atlantic City, to the Democratic National Convention, where they challenged the all-white delegation and said, we are the rightful, we are the rightful Democrats from Mississippi. And they waged a high-profile, uh, nationally televised uh, hearing in which Fannie Lou Hamer gave a stirring speech saying, is this America, is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our phones off the hook because we just want to be decent citizens? And they made that challenge, trying to get seated. And, of course, LBJ was terrified there'd be a walkout, and uh, they, they quashed the challenge. But they did get the guarantee, the Freedom Democratic Party got the guarantee, that there would never again be a segregated delegation seated at a Democratic National Convention and there never was. So another victory for Freedom Summer. Ben, how has this uh, inspired you to do the work you do? In a minute, we want to go back to Edgar Ray Killen, who is alive and who has served a couple of years in jail so far. Well, the inspiration, I think, came um, knowing that it doesn't take a lot of people to make a whole lot of change, and that's a good thing. So what we do is we form coalitions like with David, and we make change. Uh, I think what's important, I think one thing, one part of the discussion we're missing here is that what took place in the 60s was not just some group of evil people committing murders. It was sustained, it was sanctioned by the state government. Otherwise, these murders would not have occurred. And I think if we can draw a parallel to the Sovereign Commission in Mississippi, to the COINTELPRO, that, took, that was in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, you know. People died as a result of Jagger Hoover. And I think that, um, I think we need to think about America so this thing doesn't happen. It could happen again. So it does happen again on no level. We need to have, a, again, a serious discussion about race. Mickey, how did you get Edgar Ray Killen to talk so much? <clears throat> when he got indicted, 
there was a window of opportunity where we were offered one interview in his lawyer's office. Uh, we, of course, took that interview, and the parameters were you can't talk about